What is your vision for our future? Perhaps less pandemics, space travel, cure to cancer, greener earth or robotics? Well, I hope to convince you today that leadership has special meaning and place in science because we are slowly losing the people, the very people who are helping us realize these visions. But before we talk about losing these people, let's first dive into and see where these people come from. Now, as you're born, you're crawling around, and the more you crawl around, the more you're exploring, the more you like to do so, and your parents might or might not block the electrical outlets. In my case, they didn't. And you move over to 12 to 13 years of secondary education. Now, on top of that, let's add four years, three to four years of bachelor's degree. And on top of that, let's add two years of master's. And on top of that, let's add three to six years of doctoral work. Actually, I'm not done. And on top of that, add another three years of postdoc, postdoctoral training, maybe one or two of them, and all with hopes that one day you will make it into a professor. There are different names for this, group leaders, professors, PIs. Regardless, they are all there in order to answer the questions that really interest them right at the border of what is known and what is not, so that we can push forward our dreams and our visions. Unfortunately, this step that takes you from your doctoral training to your professorship, we're losing people around that step. But don't take my word for it. A recent article in Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences by Milojevic et al. tracked people who received their doctoral degrees in 1960s. And they looked at how long does it take them how long does it take to lose half of them, half of those people that received their doctors back then? Can you guess that number? Guessed it, it's probably 35 years. Which is perfect, because that's about retirement. Do you want to know what that number is today? Can you guess that number? That's a good guess. Exactly, that number is just five. We are at the height of giving out doctoral degrees, but somehow we're also at the height of losing people from science. And it comes as no surprise that as recent as last month, an article came out in a journal of science that said professors are, having, are struggling to recruit postdocs. Interesting, because I'm a postdoc, and I went through a certain experiences, one of the reasons why I stand in front of you today. Now, in order to answer these questions, I went back and I looked at myself. and I said, why did I get into science? So I sat down in my notebook and I drew this graph, which I have converted into a digital version, which kind of was my naive take on how your interest and your curiosities grow as you acquire more knowledge. Now, as you, when you're young, of course, you're not able to go to university, so your curiosity starts growing as you're trying to pick into the electrical outlet. In my case, right around when I was five or six, I was just dying to know how many matches it would take to light my parents' dining table on fire. I was successful with one match left in the box. But that's a lot of different kinds of trouble. But as you move to your middle, your secondary education, you learn, and this learning really propels you forward. And hopefully, it will keep propelling you all the way down to a professorship. But reality is not ideal, is it? In my experience, my graph looks something like that. And very, I was very fortunate that my graph didn't turn into this. 
because unfortunately for many people that are dear to me, dear friends, and people that I've heard of, this has happened to them. I bounced back and reflected upon my experiences, and I thought, Who, what is it then? Is it the hard work? Is it because science is hard? Uh, is it late nights? It was none of those. I was gladly working hard. I identified that it was the people. Back when I was a kid, my older brothers would constantly share with me the things that they learned in school for themselves. I didn't understand much of them, I just knew that there are a gazillion number of these particles in this little dot that my brother put on a paper. I just was amazed. In the sixth grade, when I first had biology class, our teacher would come in with his wrinkly throw his jacket on a, on a chair and talk with so much passion about biology that I, everyone was hooked, everyone was listening. And when, he, for the first time, he told me about photosynthesis, I, my mind was blown, because to me, these inanimate objects, these trees, had so much life happening beneath that surface. I took a couple of hits on my interest later on, and I was able to identify that, yes, yet it is, in fact, the people. During my first attempt to a doctoral degree, this happened exactly, and I identified that none of these three things I had in that experience. I was not valued, nor respected, nor supported. And unfortunately, this is true, not just for the people that I've seen and that I've known. There's a large community of people out there, and they're all suffering in silence. Academicians, scientists are, are by nature kind of introverted, and they don't really speak up about it, besides to them, to each other, which makes the parties very fun. <laughs> so I dug into it more, and what I found was that there was an article, apparently, already addressing this issue in Nature, that surveyed over 3,000 scientists, both leadership and the trainees. And what they found was that there was a big discrepancy between how the leadership thought they were leading as and what the trainees thought they were being led as. A very big discrepancy. And it was not a surprise to me to see a graph in this article that basically showed that over 71% were not trained in leadership. 71% out of 10 professors or group leaders you know, three are only having some sort of a training. Just three. So before we really get and put our shoes on and start judging people, but let's put ourselves in their spot and let's see from their perspective. Because when they get to this position after years and years of education and training and hard work, they have to they have to publish their findings. They have to show for their work. Well, to publish, you need data. And to have data, we live in 21st century. Who are we kidding? We need money. Well, you, you can have all these things, but you cannot have 25 hands. So what you need are people to do the work. And the way this happens, is it happens usually at universities, where some group of people come to you and say, I would like to learn. But in the process, I will do the work. And hence, you allow them to do this, you teach them, they give you the data. And it's really balanced, because if any part of these fall off, then goes the person's position. And hence, this idea out there that says, publish or perish. And you can imagine the amount of pressure that this puts on the leadership today. So, in my search for answers, I was trying to learn what is it exactly leadership that is missing in our group, or in the lab, or in the universities. And I came to hearing talks by Simon Sinek, who introduced me to the methods that, and theories applied by James Kars. Dr. James Kars came up with this finite and infinite game theory. 
So what are finite and infinite games? Just in short, finite games are things like, like you know, volleyballs, football championships, and games where you know who you're playing, there is a certain goal that needs to be reached, and there is a certain time period. And an only unfortunate thing here is that in business world and in science world, this game model leads to big fish eating the small fish. There are labs or groups with 50 people, and there are groups with just one. Very good ideas to research, to help us realize our dreams, but not enough people. And this that I showed you earlier, the way we, the current system works, as you can see here, it really resembles the corporate system where the people, the icons that you see on the screen, they resemble more of employees, not people that are supposed to be learning, but more like people to generate something for someone else. I dare us to try and apply infinite theory to the way we approach science today. Because infinite games, there is no end. There are no winners, there are no losers. There are players that you might know of, and there might be players you don't know of. The rules change. And the only thing about this game is the perpetuation of the game. So you keep on playing the game. All those visions we talked about, greener earth or no cancer or space travel, you cannot win at these things. The best you can do is perpetuate the game against it. You can develop yourself and you develop yourself and you develop yourself. And for humanity, today, to be able to do this, we have to create tomorrow's scientists. Because if we run out of players in the field, then we lose. And I think the recent pandemic kind of put things in perspective for us. So then, it means that every trainee would be valued as a player for the humanity tomorrow. And in the process, we will generate the data, we will generate the publications, and most definitely, we will acquire the money. And only then, we create more minds, more players, against something that is out there to get us. We make the diseases cured. We make the space travel happen. We make the robotics happen finally. Move things over from movies to reality. So if you are an aspiring scientist today, you might be a student, you're looking into doing this, or you might be a doctoral candidate who's wishing to move on to the postdoc or to professorship, I just ask you, I urge you, don't give up. Don't give up just because you've had certain bad experiences before. It's not your fault. But I dare you to look for certain things in a new environment that you would like to join. Number one, look for the diversity. I know we hear about it a lot, but diversity is really a sign of open-mindedness. Look and evaluate the leadership. If you ask the people in the, in the group that you would like to join, if they say that they, they receive too much support or too little, these are all red flags. A perfect amount of support is somewhere in between. Check for the ability of, the, of, the, of your new peers to think independently. Check and ask to speak with the alumni. Where have they gone? And if one thing I can tell you today to take with you from that perspective is ask to speak to your peers in private and assure them of confidentiality so they can tell you the things they would normally tell their friends without, being, without the fear of retaliation. And if you are in a leadership position today, ask yourself, do you empower your team? Do you engage your team? Do you pass the ownership of what you're doing in your project to your team? Do you create the psychological safety that is much needed in such a stressful environment? 
Do you coach or do you command? Do you encourage people to think and to speak up? Do you speak last? And these things, you, don't take, you have to take my word for it. These are David Marquette's words from his book, Leadership is Language. And if any of those terms you just read and meant nothing to you or meant something you haven't heard of, please ask yourself, do I need leadership training today? And if your answer is a no, then your answer is yes. Thank you.